So good afternoon, everybody. Um, normally I would not allow you to distance yourself and I would come walking right out there amongst you and you'd have to, it'd have to be closer, but with the camera and with the microphone, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay talking back here. So my name is Clayton Clark and I am the general manager for Green Mountain Transit. And I wanna start by thanking you all uh, for being here tonight because what we're gonna talk about tonight is something that GMT Myself, all of our employees, our board of commissioners, you know, it's something that we're not happy with. We're not happy to talk about the potential of reducing service. You know, we, the people that serve on our board, the people that come to work at GMT, uh, they do this because they feel that public transit is something that provides value and service to their community. And Reducing that service, reducing that value to the community is the opposite of what we would like to do. But we have a situation where um, over the past few years, um, the cost of providing our service has grown at a steep rate where the money that we receive to provide that service it has grown, but it has grown at a much slower rate. What that means is, is that and next fiscal year for GMT, we have about a $2 million gap between the cost of providing service and the revenue that we're gonna get. The, um, the way we have survived uh, recently, because we've had this gap for um, about four years, the way we've survived is that when the pandemic happened, we received COVID relief funds, federal dollars, uh, that we were then able to use, um, oh, welcome, Thomas, good to see you. Uh, we used, um, and Thomas, if you could just sign in when you get the chance. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so that is how we filled the gap. And so we, we, we received this money. Um, we know that it wouldn't be sustainable forever, uh, but we wanted to be able to continue to provide as much service as we could. Um, and so those COVID relief funds will be exhausted within the next 12 months. We went to the legislature and we talked to them and we said, hey, this is the situation we're in. We're gonna have um, you know, this funding gap. We're gonna need your help. And what we heard from the legislature last session was, you know, there's a lot of demands for state funds. We want you to work on building a sustainable program where you're, where, where you're financially sustainable within your budget. And so in order for us to do that, we have to contemplate the reduction of service and, um, and hence why we're here. So <clears throat> the, um, so first, thank you for being here. Uh, because when you sign that sheet and when you do these, your comments, we are gonna transcribe them and everybody that has a decision making authority um, over the amount of money that we receive um, is gonna get these comments. So they're gonna be able to see exactly what the impact will be for you if these come in or these reductions uh, come in. And so what I'm hoping is, is that when you talk to us, if you could provide comments that are as, you know, as direct as possible, this is what the impact will be to me. This will be what the impact is uh, to my family. Uh, because that's the information that decision makers need to hear to help them with their prioritization of, of funds. One of the things that I wanna do is make sure that you understand um, who GMT is because uh, you know it, people may use our service but they may not understand that we are a municipality and so that means just like the uh, town or city that you live in we're a government entity I bring this up because one of the things I want to make sure that you know is that our uh, our goal when it comes to any budget is just to break even we do not have a profit motive. We do not have, we're not a for-profit company. We don't have shareholders. 
Our board of commissioners are all volunteers who get paid nothing to provide hundreds of hours of volunteer time uh, managing uh, GMT. And I wanna make sure that you know that nobody at GMT, nobody on the GMT board of commissioners is gonna get a bonus, is gonna make extra money for cutting, for cutting uh, service. That's not what we're about. Uh, this is not an attempt for us to maximize profits because we just aren't a profit uh, generating activity. The, uh, <clears throat> I want to recognize some folks tonight. Um, first and foremost, I want to recognize uh, Curtis Clough um, and Ryan. Ryan, I don't, I don't know your last name, who are from the Teamsters Union. The majority of uh, employees at Green Mountain Transit are union members who are with the Teamsters. And uh, when we think about the impact on service cuts, there's the external impact, of course, on riders in our communities, but there's also the internal impact because these cuts, if they went through, would require layoffs. And we just want to make sure that folks know that just as you all are contemplating, how am I going to live my life without this service? You know, so our employees are also contemplating, am I going to have a job, you know, next year? And so that's something that I want to make sure that you know that we're very concerned about. Um, I want to introduce our staff members. Um, we have Ash and we have Chris. Chris uh, Damiani is our um, uh, director of planning. And he is the one who uh, takes all of the, uh, the data uh, on ridership and, uh, and puts it together in our routes and helps with the scheduling. And so he is kind of uh, the, the, the person that um, is the mastermind behind uh, having our service run. Ash um, is the person that helps with communication. If you get service alerts, if you find out, hey, um, this route is uh, off today because of construction, chances are uh, you got that alert from Ash. So <clears throat> I'm only gonna talk for a few more minutes and then the rest of the time is gonna be your time. Um, I, I see that people have had the handout that shows all of the potential um, uh, reductions. And I'm going to do a very brief overview of that. If there are specific questions about it, um, you can certainly ask us and we'll do our best uh, to answer. Um, what I want to just give you now is, a, is an overview. So first off, our funding gap is about $2 million, but our service reduction list um, is about $3 million. And so what that means is, is that we're going into this process thinking that we're going to get input from communities, that we're going to get input from the municipalities and from the state that gives us the funds, and um, and so that our expectation is that not all of these reductions that have been identified are going to have to come through. This really is a public process where your input is going to influence the final plan. That final plan um, we hope to have um, out uh, in November, and um, and what you can expect to see is that it will be a prioritized list um, that will uh, allow folks to see that, hey, if, if our funding gap is $2 million, then here's how far the list will go. If our funding gap is $2.5 million, here's how far it would go. And, and so that uh, essentially what would happen is, is that we would only cut the service necessary uh, to balance. Um, and so that we're not looking to cut any more than we have to. So there's four phases um, to the cuts. Uh, we're in sort of the first phase right now um, where we're having um, uh, changes that happened in Burlington to the neighborhood specials that operate during the school year. We consolidated some of those routes. Uh, so that was a change that happened this um, past August. Our, um, our arrangement with the city of Burlington is that we're allowed to make um, uh, changes to those neighborhood special routes uh, uh, every year to increase their efficiency. And so we were able to do some route consolidation uh, that does increase uh, the time that some students are on the bus, 
but it covers the same geographic area, and so that change has already happened. Um, we're also um, expecting to transfer the 116 commuter to Tri-Valley Transit. That is another service provider. Um, they already have uh, operated half of the 116 <coughs> commuter routes, and so they're gonna be going to operating uh, uh, the full service. That's scheduled to happen on October 1st, and that happened because the town of Heinsburg decided to leave Green Mountain Transit and to get their public transit service from Tri-Valley Transit. So that's the first phase. The second phase would be reductions that would happen in November and December. The first of which um, would be the elimination of the Jeffersonville commuter. And I'm certainly expecting and hoping to hear from folks tonight uh, about the Jeffersonville commuter. Um, the Jeffersonville commuter uh, connects Jeffersonville to, to, to downtown. It's a, a service that uh, we've heard from folks already is critical to the people that use it, but it has low ridership, and it costs us about $63 per rider to operate that service. And so that's why it was uh, identified uh, for a reduction. The other thing that we're looking to do in November and December is to decrease service um, on Saturdays and uh, uh, speci uh, specifically Saturday evenings. Representative Dodge, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it looks like you're going to have to be up front. Mm -hmm. you know? That's not so fun. Yes. And so, um, so in November and December, we're looking at the Jeffersonville commuter and reducing uh, service on Saturday evenings primarily. Saturday evenings, um, again, we have lower ridership. We also have some of our highest costs because as you can imagine, most of our employees want to be off on Saturday. And so we end up uh, having more folks on overtime and more folks having forced overtime on Saturday than any other day. And so that means it's a combination of low ridership with high costs. The third phase would happen in February and March. Um, there would be a very uh, limited impact uh, to the communities around us um, in Essex uh, Junction uh, for those because it would focus primarily on link service uh, between Montpelier and uh, Burlington and between St. Albans and Burlington. So for the Montpelier link, we have about half the ridership that we had pre-pandemic on those routes. And so um, because of that, we're going to be looking to probably reduce the number of runs uh, that will be coming from Montpelier to Burlington. And for the St. Albans link, we're looking to combine that with the Milton commuter. And so right now you have the St. Albans link traveling um, southbound on 89, and you have the Milton computer, a commuter <laughs> traveling southbound on Route 7, sort of parallel to it. What we would like to do is combine those, uh, those. And we think it would actually, um, even though the St. Albans link will take a little longer, it will also mean that people in Milton um, will have the option of traveling north, um, where right now uh, that Milton commuter only comes uh, into, uh, into Burlington. The last phase um, would be in June of 2025, and this is the worst phase. This is the phase where the bulk of the cuts would happen. This is the phase that would be primarily the local service. And in this phase, we potentially could see the elimination of the eight, which is a circulator in downtown Burlington that connects the old north end to the downtown. The number 10, which connects Essex Experience, town of Essex with Williston. And the number 11, which connects downtown to South Burlington and the airport. These are our three lowest ridership local routes. Um, they are ones that uh, two of those routes, the number 10 and 11, have been previously identified to us by VTrans as routes that need to be amended because of their low ridership and because of their low cost or their high cost per rider. So. Uh, that is the reason why they are potentially um, being reduced, um, is, is because of that. What I'm hoping to hear from you all tonight 
especially about the Jeffersonville commuter and especially about the number 10 is what that means for you because we want to make sure everybody that can help in this uh, situation knows uh, what the facts are. The last item that I want to bring up um, as far as changes is that um, we are going to ask for a increase to the ADA fare. And so we are very lucky tonight that we have Adam and Morgan from SSTA. Um, we work with SSTA uh, for our ADA program so that anyone who lives within three quarters of a mile of a fixed route bus and for whatever reason they're not able to use the fixed route bus because of a disability, um, they get door-to-door -door service from SSTA. Um, and one of the things that we would like to propose is increasing that door-to-door -door fare from $3 to $4. Um, we had originally uh, considered having a $4 fare on that service last year when we were going through the uh, fare process or uh, the process of determining our fares. Uh, we received feedback from Adam that, uh, uh, that going to $4 was going to be too much too fast. So we went with $3 and at this time, well, we think just because of our financial situation, we have to contemplate the 4 so those are the changes in summary that are laid out. And now I, I'm gonna get into listening mode. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit right there and I'm gonna ask anyone who has um, thoughts or opinion about this, to, if they could, if they could come up so that the microphone could, uh, uh, could get their comments, uh, so that the camera um, uh, would get them because this is going to be broadcast on and I've already brain dumped to a town meeting TV town meeting TV hello welcome hello. so much if you want to just sign in and take a seat that would be great and um, I do know you know some of you probably want to make comments or maybe nervous about coming up and standing in front of uh, you all if you prefer to give your comments from where you're at that's totally okay and uh, um, and we'll just uh, go from there. So with that said, um, with, this, with the small group that we have, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna give you all any time constraints. If we do find that somebody is talking um, a, 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 a bit, uh, that we need to let other folks uh, be able to have a, uh, have a say, you know, I may you know, get up and interrupt, but really um, we're gonna try to just have this for you come speak your mind and we'll be in listening mode. Make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm gonna go sit down and whoever would like to start us off, please come on down and, and uh, do so. And I'm gonna leave that seat for you. Kind. And I will sit right here. So who wants to start us off? Excellent. And one of the things I would like to ask is that since we transcribe all of these, if you could start off by telling us your name. My name is Brian Hamlin. I am 27 and I've been using the bus routes in Essex uh, for almost a decade now. Um, it started around the end of high school when I started needing to transfer to college uh, in Williston at Vermont Tech uh, to go to school because I do not drive, I don't have a license, and I cannot afford a car, nor the associated costs. Um, I have also been working in Williston, as a, the bus route was able to give me a job over there that I otherwise would not be able to travel to. Um, in that time, there was a previous scare where the Essex bus route specifically uh, was going to be removed, and I attended that meeting as well. Um, what ended up coming of that was that it was merged with the Williston route, which benefited me to an extent because it meant I only needed one bus to get to the places I was going. I'm sure it inconvenienced some people, but it was still better than not having a bus. Uh, I now run into an issue again where not having access to a bus route by the end of 2026 could leave me out of a job or unreliably able to get to the job uh, and unable to access my school. Uh, I know there are other riders on the bus that I see pretty frequently 
uh, I'm going to assume that they also have scheduled things that they go to pretty frequently, such as a job or a school. Um, and so they could potentially lose their jobs too. So while there is a concern about GMT employees losing their job, there's also a concern about GMT riders losing their jobs. Um, we moved a couple of years ago. We were living uh, down the street from Maple Street Park. And we moved to the other side of Essex, specifically looking for a place that was on the bus route. Um, it's in a very convenient spot for accessing the bus. Uh, and while the expenses are somewhat high, again, it would be more expensive to just not have a bus to get there. Um, and I would honestly rather change my schedule around and maybe even pay higher fares just to have a chance to ride the bus to get to the places I'm going than just not have a bus at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, who else would like to go? Oh, Mary go? Yeah. Perfect timing. <laughs> Sorry, I was late. No uh, my name is Carrie Miller. I live in Williston, and I work in Burlington and also in Essex Junction. So it's important for me to be able to get to and from jobs. I appreciate what was said about the potential of us losing our jobs, but also that has to be of some concern to businesses. I know they have a hard time hiring people, and if people can't get from place to place, they also won't be able to be part of the labor pool. That's all I have to say. Hello. Hello. My name is Kim, and I moved to Essex six years ago from South Hero, where if you don't have a car, you don't do anything. Uh, and I specifically chose Essex because uh, I live out by Essex Cinema. There's everything out there that I would ever need. The only two things that I use public transportation for are getting to the UVM Med Center, which I have to do two or three times a year, and to get me out to Tilly Drive for orthopedic purposes. So losing that service would mean that I would have to pay, I think it's $30 for a, I know it's $30 for a uh, Uber mm -hmm. to get me from the 10 miles out to Tilly three times a year for my knee shots, uh, an expense that's kind of outlandish. And what I would also like to say is that I wouldn't mind paying a higher fare either. Uh, I'm a senior, so I, I pay very little, and I would you know, be very happy to pay more. It would be a shock, and I was shocked to see this coming down the pike, and I hope that uh, we can retain service out here in Essex. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Kim, do you mind us having your last name too? Hunter. Kim Hunter, okay, thank you. I'll go there. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, I'm Beth Abustin. I'm your police book warrior. Um, I'm also a vet. I um, was with Grand Marshal here at Six Junction for the Memorial Day Parade a couple years back. Um, I'm representing some people that are not here. Um, I live in Essex Junction, but you know, Essex Junction, even though it became a city, there's still um, a lot of things that we as Essex Junction people utilize in Essex, um, such as the larger grocery stores, um, Hannaford's and Price Chopper. I'm also a SSTA writer. Um, it has some drawbacks, but for the most part, you know, I really appreciate the door-to-door -door service. Uh, today, I'm paying $9. I had to go to the edge and then um, over here and then back home. So $9 a little bit stretched for me sometimes, but I, again, you know, I'm willing to pay that. I'm even willing to pay the extra dollar for next year um, to get around. Um, 
like everything as a Vermonter, I've learned to adapt to the situations um, that are handed to us. Um, I've reduced some of my um, outings. Um, of course, in the winter, I'm pretty much home anyway, so that's not a problem. Um, I did have a question about um, using, possibly getting an environmental grant for bus services. I don't know if that's even a thing, um, but if there is, I'd like to see that. Um, I know a person that works at Hennifer. She's probably older than I am. She's been working there for many years as a bag person, bag lady. And um, I know she's, I believe she's coming from Burlington or Winooski. And that's her only source of um, yeah, transportation. Yeah. On the, on the yeah. Um, there's also um, an immigrant family that lives down on River Road that their only source of transportation is the bus. Um, having to go around that loop, you know, if I want to go to Maple Street Park and I did not have the SSTA, you have to go to Amtrak, which requires another $2 to get onto the uh, uh, Route 10 and then go all the way around um, to get to Maple Street Park um, or to Hanford, I mean, sorry, to um, Walmart, and Walmart is one of my favorite stores. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, for people who ride the bus, that would mean that without that trip, um, they would have to go all the way through Burlington and then come back to Walmart. Um, let me see, I just wanna see if there's anything else. I would like to see if there's a possibility of maybe just if, Worst comes to worst, um, a reduction in service, like they have the grocery buses in Burlington, I guess, the grocery to the different stores, if that could be provided. And um, again, for SSTA, I would like to, because um, I know that you have to live within a certain range, and I don't know how, how that would affect us. I know in Colchester, they don't have bus service. And I don't know how people who require SSTA um, are able to utilize SSTA if they're not living within a range of a bus stop. So, and of course, that's going to be a big factor for myself. Like I said, um, you know, um, as extension, even though this is my home um, for the last 15 years, I am very much part of the other communities that are here, going to the hospital, going to Hannaford's Price Chopper, um, even, you know, like going to the movies, I have to plan because even now it's very limited. You know, if I want to go out for a restaurant um, as a bus rider, um, um, you have to be back home by six o'clock or something. So it doesn't even allow you to go to watch a late movie or, or go to the restaurant. Um, I think that's all I have. If I have something else, I'll let you know. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I love the idea of um, seeking the environmental grants. Mm. One, of, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that next week's GMT board meeting, they're going to be hopefully approving articles of incorporation for us to create an affiliated nonprofit. That will allow us to do direct fundraising, but what it will also do is allow us to apply for a lot of grants that are only eligible to, to nonprofit organizations. So that's definitely something that we're looking at uh, uh, doing to augment our budget. Who else uh, um, has comments? <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Diane Clemens, and I live in Essex Junction, where I happen to be on the Planning Commission. So it kind of colors what I'm going to say. That in fact, I used to be a school board member. So here's my comments. Cutting back on Route 10 to Essex Center will impact students who take the bus. Mm -hmm. And those who take the bus go to the high school, and also those who need to go back and forth to work for their employment. Um, it will impact getting to Walmart by the bus. And I'm sure that is not just people 
here in the city, but a lot of different places. Cutting back on Route 2 and a little farther down the road will impact those who use it on Saturdays for working and shopping. And yes, I see a lot of people with the shopping bags on the bus um, because they use it to go up the, up to the, the market and, uh, and then up the center, okay, or whatever. We have developers who will be putting, uh, who are putting up apartments or have put up apartment buildings who told their renters or their potential renters that the bus stop was out front. Literally, it is for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And so they said, they, well, we don't need parking spaces. We got the bus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so emphasis added, you know, and, and so I don't want to make the developers liars, and neither do you. No. Okay, so um, we need, I recognize that you have a budget and need to cut things. I understand that some routes cost more than others. As someone who could have taken the link down to Waterbury, I would have had to go to Burlington to grab it because it didn't stop on the way. So you're losing a lot of potential customers. I would have been one of them because of the hassle of going to Burlington was just as bad as just hopping in the car and going to Waterbury. So you're missing some customers. Um, I will say that this summer I used the bus. I was very happy. My daughter thought I was nuts. Okay, but quite frankly, walking to the end of the block and hopping on, going to UVM, it literally was almost door to door. I, as you yeah. can see, I limp. So going the block wasn't all that bad, but hey, once you get to the medical center, you're there. So I'm sure the others like me, okay, who are utilizing the service, because quite frankly, it's a whole lot easier than playing with the parking lot. So let's get smart about this. If you need to become a nonprofit to get those grants, I recognize that my tax dollars going from the city, um, because you bill each of the towns for this service. I don't want to give Essex Town the reason to give you less money, <laughs> okay? And I know in the past, they've been very good at finding ways to cut a budget. So please do not impact our students and the people who are employed at the school district or any of the places around here by the fact that the bus system is going to cancel Route 10 and parts of Route 2 at some point in time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. So much. I mean, has anybody discussed the possible impact on SST riders in this extension to lose the Main Street number 10 going up to the town? One person has mentioned that, right? Yeah. Has it? And, you and so, it, but have you discussed whether that's an actual impact or not? Um, we haven't. Uh, uh, just to speak clearly, one of the things that would happen if we were to lose the number 10 is that the folks that are using uh, ADA service along the number 10 would no longer be able to have that. Yikes. That's not good. No. Yes. That's not that good. Is. That's what some people are saying. That's experience. Yes. Yeah. I also wanted to make a comment about the environmental impact mm -hmm. board for my personal per preference is that I don't have a car because I don't want the added extra cost of maintenance and insurance and and uh, just costs a lot of money to operate a car and I can get most of my services walking where I live and it's just those tours it's like I would like to akin it to a box of band-aids you don't use them every day but boy when you need one they're right there absolutely uh and the environmental part to me is uh i used to i remember when i used to work at ibm i would travel from the island in here every day one car per person uh, person per car was mm -hmm. all i saw hundreds of them mm -hmm. and so for me the bus is a way for me to contribute uh to a lesser carbon footprint and absolutely. so absolutely yeah there's there's a lot of uh i used to be in the military and we used to talk about um some things that were force multipliers that, hey we do this and it helps all of these different areas public transit is a force multiplier for communities hmm. it addresses 
how do you get to the housing that's affordable? It addresses mm -hmm. how do you get to your care? How do you help the environment? Mm -hmm. How do we keep cars off the road so traffic goes you know, better? Absolutely. All of these things come together and are helped by public transit. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Um, one is that I think as taxpayers, we expect public services for our taxes. Mm -hmm. And so it feels kind of weird to me to think that we're paying taxes to our community and then it's not being used for public transportation, which is an important piece of community. Another thing is that I've noticed that the buses that we receive on our route, the 10 route specifically, mm -hmm. um, have been inconsistent what bus it is. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get a bus that's more appropriate for the number of riders and sometimes you get like a really long bus that will never fill up. Mm -hmm. um, now, sometimes the bus does mostly fill up with high school students, like when high school gets out. Mm -hmm. um, but specifically, it just seems weird to me that we oftentimes have buses that are much larger than we need mm -hmm. for our route. Okay. And I, I'm going to answer that question uh, because everywhere I go, I get that question. And, uh, but I want to check to make sure that there's not comments about the service reductions first. Well, I've got a bunch of them. Okay, we'll do that. But let's make sure we come back to that because um, uh, that was one of the first questions. I, I joined GMT last year, and one of the first questions I asked is, why do we only have one size, you know, bus essentially a, a full size 35, uh, 35 or 40, 40 plus? 40 exactly. is the most. Yeah. So, so I'm Chris Hamlin, and I'm actually the mother of the individual who's very well spoken over there. Um, I am responsible for getting him places if he can't get someplace, which means that I cut into my work time to do it. He goes to a doctor in Williston, his primary is in Williston. We can't even get to the appointment over there. So I've been lucky enough that he's been able to take a bus to get over to Williston. And then I just take him from that point to the doctor's appointment. But it cuts into my work schedule just by having to bring him places. So if you cut the buses, that's going to put my job at risk or he won't be able to get someplace at all. So that's a problem in itself. I work in South Burlington and I'm lucky enough to have a car, but if something happens with that car, I don't have somebody to give me a ride. So I would be relying on the transportation and I work in South Burlington. So that's going to be problematic because even before, because we were at the last meeting about around this happening, um, that we were concerned with like how long it would take me to get to work and how long it would take me to get home from work. So, but at least there's an option of being able to get to work. Um, I was talking to my supervisor today about it and I'm like, look, I'm just letting you know, my son may not be able to have a bus to get him back and forth at some point, And that's going to put a strain on me because he does need to get to work. He does need to get to school and stuff. So that's a problem in itself. Um, I also used to work at the food shelf. I used to volunteer at the food shelf up here. And a lot of the consumers were saying they were having problems getting there due to the bus routes. And if you take away the bus routes, then you're now putting people so they don't have food on their tables to feed themselves. And um, my son just addressed that part of it. I work at a place where there's clients that rely on the buses, and that's their only transportation. And Essex would be one of the routes that they would need. Others are in Burlington. So cutting really um, important routes out. Not to say that none of them are, but that's... I don't know why we keep coming up on the chopping block, honestly, because this is the second meeting we've been at for this. Uh, then um, I'm wondering why, like, we can't tap into somehow some of the local area places that rely on them. Like, I know that we talk about school budgets all the time and stuff, but my son was telling me in a message the other day that in the morning when he goes to school or work, um, there's like three to four people on the bus and in the afternoon when he comes back, the bus is flooded by high school students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that the districts had major issues like a lot of other districts have with transportation, with busing mm -hmm. and finding drivers. And I don't know why we can't come to some type of agreement with school districts to try to help them out with that scenario, but get, get funding into where it needs to go to keep the other buses alive. And I think that's probably it at this point, but yeah, there's just all kinds of things relying on these buses. I mean, at any given scenario, you could lose your car. Mm -hmm. We we moved up to Essex Center. I know we brought this up. We moved up to Essex Center, or I guess we call it town now, but up near CVS. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why we chose to live in that area, because it's not a great place for me to be living with where I work, is that he could get everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be taking away that option if that bus goes away. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
of the things that uh, I want to talk about ridership is that, you know, we developed this plan uh, with ridership sort of as our guide. But the thing that we also understand is that if you are, it doesn't matter how many people are using your bus. If you rely on your bus, it's just as important in your life, you know, as those buses that are, are full with others. Right. Yesterday, um, we had a person at our, at our public meeting. We have a legacy route that runs once a day that averages three riders. One of those three riders came in and talked to us about the importance of that and to his life and how his life would be changed, even for a route that just has three riders. And so, ab absolutely. Who else has a comment that they would like to make? Thomas. Oh. So some of you are familiar with me because I was with me last night in Burlington. In Burlington. So my name is Thomas Caswell. I'm, I lived in Essex Junction for 11 years. And before that, I lived in Jericho. Yeah, it's a Jericho. In addition to some of the things they've said, and said, it said, I am worried about my hometown lo losing their own, Jericho losing their only bus service that they've had since October 2013. 13, and by the way, I moved out of that that town just four months months before to, because my parents split, because mainly because my parents split and she, I moved here and said I decided to join her because I was, because the isolation in Jericho was just insane. I said, however, when I had to, when I was still at MM, student at MU, but still moved here, moved here, I was able to get that inbound Jeffer, bus from Jeffersonville to come back. To, was to come back into town. That was amazing. Great. But, but, the thing, but even though things have changed over the years of that route, they changed that route, and the buses they're using are not the same. Whether they were used back then, now are all gone, and, and now are gone. The, the buses themselves, not the, the buses themselves, not the route. That's also not the route. It's changed. The things have changed. Yeah, I still hesitant about my own town losing that service. So I thought about. Uh, and you got an email about this, about this, about a route, a new local route that could replace the Jeffersonville commuter that starts here at Amtrak and goes to Jericho and back. The one back that could replace it. In fact, if you're at market, say market 32, 32, two, there's a bus that can shoot you straight, straight back here, back to SC Jump Shop, go all the way around. That's a, that's a bonus. No, oh, that's a bonus. So thought about so thinking about a local route that runs 30, 45 minutes and that so goes to Jericho Mar Market and say and back. Like at least at least those next year, but may also allow for for ridership improvement in that area, area and get more residents residents or Essex Center and Jericho be able to get that air. They talk about it's because I have used that used that route route ten, route 10 formerly one e. Like when when I first started running it was one e. It was one E, and the one E in the Route Ten was split. The four, the Essex Center was Route Four, and just did a loop around, did a loop around the area, and limited times a day, times a week, sometimes a weekday. Is that what about? Because I have used that to just go straight to Williston for year, straight to Williston for years, and I don't want to lose that, and I don't want to lose that direct connection. Not even, not even on, not even on Saturday, because. Because uh, because uh, Saturday and Sunday I can compromise, but th the other days I appreciate that connection, direct connection to Williston without even have without even have to go all the way to around Burlington or so, so et cetera to connect to that number one. It's not fair. It, it was just not it just that's just not fair to lose that sir, so, to lose that service. No, the the route is because Saturday, Saturday I don't see it take take much much at least going around the loop. To, on the Loop Essex Center, but before before pre before COVID, the Essex Center didn't even have service out there until on Saturday. Oh, sorry, so that's probably the one big improvement to, about there. To, to, I said sometimes to be waiting for like a long time after it's scheduled to arrive and doesn't even show up, and I have to go to the Amtrak and board there. I don't know, and sometimes it runs late. I don't know what's heck that happens. This doesn't happen so much on the weekdays, however. Yeah, is so, that that direct can so train it. Talk about the ske the scheduling is like it's like I get it I get it. they have to run a seventy five minute schedule so so the 
And so they can do a loop because they, it takes a whole hour for them to do the whole loop. And then they need to lay over at Walmart for a little bit to get before they can do the next next trip. Duh. Yeah, that next trip. And <clears throat> duh. It's, just, it's the times. It's the times of day. I can consider myself. What if I need to go to Montpelier early in the morning? Duh. In the morning, that's 745 a.m. is the only one that I could to go to Williston Park and to Williston Park ride. Right? And there's a chance that I could miss it if I don't have my bike to like to 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 get me go over there quickly quickly to board that at 12 a.m. if I if I need to do that in the future I said if I need to do that again in the future which is much better than going over to Burlington and I said so forth in Burlington and and so forth also the timings right right now today I noticed today I noticed was right Essex High school changed their hour, their school hours to a four eight to three fifteen, which is one thing. It's great they get the high school. Lit. So yes, it means I have to go. Means I'm on my way way to working with the Virginia Way CCS. I have to, I have to deal with the school traffic. But you know what? I got used to it last year. I'm used to it now. So, uh, last year, but it said three fifteen. The next bus that gets get Amtrak is at four o'clock. Those students are having to wait a long time for that bus to arrive and. Suggesting to 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 shift some time so they start er, signs they get so the first one is or at least or at least early in the morning and early morning but early in the morning at least they at least in Essex high school students have that time out the time have that time the time so they could get a bus at like three thirty or something that can get them over into those in, in into those areas so so yeah I'm different. On Saturday evenings, I do sometimes. Usually, usually, usually on a Saturday, I know I do not go home or any early than seven o'clock. Earlier than seven o'clock, if I use if I use the bu use the bus on Saturday evenings, and and I know what it's like to have the last bus on Saturday be at seven fifteen or eight thirty before this before these before went to eleven o'clock then ten thirty. 1040, I'm definitely grateful for that. I do not want to lose that. So do not want to go back to having to be home earlier than much earlier because there isn't a bus past eight. But there isn't a bus past eight o'clock or that's eight o'clock or having to lie my bike in the winter in the winter when I can't do that. I'm just, I want to come get me. That's just not, that's just not great. So I said, please try to, and I think it's very unfortunate that we're in this situation, like there was a, there was one employee. So I was like, "How do we get here? How do we get the three hundred? How do we end up with these three million dollar budget deficit?" But you have to realize that GMT, I work in Toy Street. They're not alone. No, there are some other states around the country, trans agencies that are experiencing also this financial fiscal cliff thanks to exhaustion of COVID relief relief funds. So I already seen this happen with Tri Valley Transit. The bus, the, the bus, Mower Valley, Rutland, the, the Rutland, because Rutland, the mover, RCT. I've already seen some of the routes either get eliminated or the, get eliminated, the, eliminated or the, or reduced or so routes that got gotten suspended but haven't come back, suspended like a while back due to, due to shortage of drivers. I had not come back because back because because as you know they you once you get let services hard once you lose service it's hard to get that it's hard to get get to get that back i think i think marble valley transit rutland has been the luckiest having the luckiest they only had to reduce their local routes to us uh, to shorten their to shorten the span to shorten their times to span of service that's it the service that's it i've seen other areas so much worse so please try to do the best you can to get that money to fill that gap that you need, need so we can keep most of the service, most of the service the way the service the way it is. And proposal to possibly re replace that, replace that to Jeffersonville with a local route that can still go to that still goes to Jer the so you know, that could run local service at a consistent time pace. Thomas, thank you so much. <laughs> never understand the ins and outs of GMT service as well as Thomas. Thomas is uh, is the final proofreader for all of our bus schedules. Well, not all of them. Well, March the... was the last time. Okay. So when these come out, Thomas she specifically is... reviewed all of them. Yes. So.
Um, I'm Brendan DeGraft. I'm an Essex uh, resident. Um, I've lived in the area for about 12 years now. Um, used to be a lot more reliant on the bus uh, to get to work and to school than I am now. Um, but between going to Champlain College, a bus pass through work, and um, COVID, I rarely paid for a fare. So I just really want to echo some of those other comments. And I'm very grateful that I haven't had to pay for a fare, but I feel like it's about my time. And kind of every time I see something like this, um, I, I just feel like I would, I would love to pay more money on the bus, um, especially if it means, you know, people that need to get to work, um, you know, can keep those routes and things like that. So especially with the, um, the monthly cap now, I feel like less frequent riders, they could um, take a little bit more of that burden. And, you know, people that use it every day wouldn't be impacted as much. Any other comments about the service reductions? Curtis. I assume this is just a prop. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's. It's for, our, uh, it's for our recording. We got both going. All right. So uh, my name is Curtis Clough, um, as Clayton said earlier. I represent a lot of the workers at GMTA uh, that are in our union, uh, the Teamsters. Um, Ironically, I also represent some of the members down at Tri-Valley Transit. Um, so I just want to make a few comments and, uh, you know, I heard quite a few things here tonight that I didn't hear yesterday. Um, it, was, it was good information. Um, number one, in Vermont, I want you to think about some of the priorities that the state has, because really transit is something that's handled by the state in the long run. They make a lot of the decisions about where the funding goes. Uh, they're the ones that evaluate the routes. Um, you know, when people talk about why is this route on the chopping block again, it's it's not necessarily because GMTA decided it needs to go on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. It's because VTrans has a report that anybody can go online and look at that says this is a bad route. And, you know, so communicating with VTrans is something that's important. They're part of the governor's, they're, they're part of the governor's purview. Uh, but VTrans in the state of Vermont, they send a lot of money, you know, they're spending a lot of money right now in the electrification of the bus fleet, particularly the GMTA. Um, you know, they're bringing in new electric buses and essentially what some of this is doing is taking those electric buses off the road when they would otherwise be out servicing routes. Um, so, you know, we wanna make sure as part of the environmental goal that the state has and that they've reiterated again and again that they want to try and meet or come as close as they can to meet. Uh, you want to have those those buses, those electric buses running that the state is spending a, a lot of money to bring in the GMTA and to set up, you know, and to have them set up. You know, the state's made that decision to do that. And, you know, you want to have those buses out there running because you're talking about this plan is talking about putting probably 230 cars a day back on the roads. Yep. So every car on the street, according to, you know, according to the government numbers, is roughly 4.6 tons of carbon in a year. That's a lot of pollution. And, this, and the state is responsible for setting those goals. And by pulling, you know, essentially pulling some of these bus routes off, they're putting cars back on the, on the road. People have come here today and say, I don't have a car because I have bus service. <coughs> some of those people are going to go purchase cars. Maybe some of those people can't drive, but some of those people are going to go purchase cars. And that is going to be something that's actually going backwards on where the state's trying to get from an environmental perspective. And that is going to have an impact. Um, you know, the other thing I want to talk about is, and I've, I've actually heard a lot of people kind of hit on this tonight to an extent. A lot of people work, you know, you, you use a bus to go to work or to go to services. And, you know, GMTA is able to have a lot of community partners. They do have community partners like UVM and some of the school districts. Um, so if you're using the bus to get to work, you know, communicate that to your job because, you know, there are community partners out there. And those community partners, what I found out last night was that they helped GMTA flex federal money. Um, additionally, you know, 
the people that really are responsible for making the decisions about the budgets uh, are the, the people making the funding decisions at the state house. Um, you know, so communicate with them and let them know how important this is to you. Let them know, you know, how you're affected by this and make sure that they understand how this is going to affect you and your community and, you know, the difference that the bus makes in your life for, for a positive way and the difference, you know, and how your life is going to be in a negative way. Because a lot of you are going to have to then move out of Essex if you can't get a car, you can't drive, you can't afford that. I think somebody said $30 per ride Uber fare. Mm -hmm. um, One way. One way. Right. So $60 every time you need exactly. a trip. Yeah. So if you can't afford that, you're going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's just going to exacerbate the housing problems that the state of Vermont already has, mm -hmm. that they spent a lot of time talking about. So, you know, try to make sure the legislature understands how the, this small issue, seemingly to them, may, really plays into a lot of the other issues and the other problems that the legislature is trying to solve in the state and how it's it's going to be moving in the wrong direction. You know, I've got some information I'm happy to hand anybody that wants to take a flyer. Uh, we talked to people last night. Obviously, a lot of our members are going to be impacted. Um, you know, the company in, in Middlebury is hoping that they can provide that service on 116, but they don't have drivers for it. So, you know, that's going to be either drivers working overtime or just a service that's not able to be provided. Um, you know, it's you're, you're talking about Clayton was talking about October. They don't have they don't have the drivers right now. Um, you know, that bus is a CDL, you know, it takes a minute to get get trained with the CDL. Um, you know, so so reach out, you know, the legislators don't decide exactly where the money goes, but they can help come up with solutions. Um, you know, like solutions that were provided by a study that the state funded, they can help come up with solutions to some of the problems. So let them know how important it is to you. Let them know how you want the state to achieve the goals that the legislature has put forward and how this is moving in the wrong direction. That's all. Thank you. you. Um, so when the driver is, tra is trained on CDL, um, is, uh, do they get a reduction in cost or do they, is it free or how, how much do the DMT contribute to their training? Um, so I can tell you that um, um, we will take people who do not have a CDL and we'll completely train them to get their CDL so that uh, there doesn't have to be any cost to them. I can tell you that we're not hiring new drivers right now because we don't want to hire people just to, to lay them off. But, but prior to us stopping hiring, uh, you, somebody could come in off the street. Uh, we, we actually have had folks, uh, one of our, some of our drivers don't even have their own car. Um, I was talking to a driver uh, of ours earlier this week that they came in, they became a bus driver, and they don't even have their own vehicle, but yet they drive a, a, a bus for us. Are they required to, uh, after the train, uh, do they spend, you know, like kids? three, four years driving the bus, I mean, um, or can they just get their CDL and leave? They can get the CDL and leave. I can tell you that we've been lucky that generally that doesn't happen. And it's it's very hard to hold somebody into a job long term if they want to, to depart. And, and our philosophy kind of is if that if somebody, especially a bus driver and a customer service you know, perspective, if they don't want to be there, I don't want to force you know, the public to have to work with them. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm curious, I noticed that I feel like the frequency of ads on the side of the buses has gone up. How much does that actually pay to cover rides? So uh, it has gone up. Uh, we have uh, basically um, contracted out to have somebody do that advertising for us because you know we're in the we're in the busing business, not the selling advertising business. and so that's why that's happened. Um, and I can tell you that like a single bus wrap uh, that we sell, it's, it's like, over 10,000. A full bus wrap is 10,000, and that is just for the putting it on a bus. That is not to have it on a bus for any length of time. Yeah. The length of time usually ends up being pretty substantial, especially for full wraps. You have to get at least a year. Mm -hmm. I don't know the current numbers off the top of my head, but in 
2020, which is the last time I looked at that specific document myself, it was upwards of $50,000 to have that on there. Yeah. And I guess considering the bus wrap thing, I've also seen buses that had smaller ads just kind of on the side. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if that would be a more um, valuable option. Essentially, uh, people can choose between having you know, like a, a small, more affordable uh, advertisement, uh, both inside and out, and uh, and then having the the full wrap is, of course, the, the the most expensive. I will say, I think in a lot of cases, having them outside is going to be more valuable than having them inside. Not only for the number of eyes, but for people that ride the bus, because a lot of the people that ride the bus might not be able to afford the things that are being advertised on the outside of the bus. Yes. What you'll find is that there's a lot of services that are advertised inside the bus. And um, and, and so ab absolutely the, the who you're marketing to, um, it's very different on the outside as opposed to the inside. Yeah, I've seen some great ads for like job openings at different places, which was awesome to have on the inside of the bus as a resource. And one of the things that I love is that, uh, and we're, we're, we're giving Stephen a <laughs> important, <laughs> people watching at home are gonna get, gonna get sick. Um, the thing that I like is that anytime I can get money that doesn't come from the taxpayer or a rider, I mean, that's just a, that's a huge yeah. win for us. Yeah. I have to go catch a bus. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Catch it while you go. Yep. <laughs> the, uh, um, and I do want to get back to the, the full-size bus question, but I just want to make sure that is any other comments about possible bus reduction? Oh, hi, Regina. Yeah. All right. So, uh, can, oh, I, can I just say something course. real quick? Oh, yeah, please do. so, um, mm -hmm. hi, neighbors. So, I am the state rep that is in the legislature, and I actually happen to sit uh, in house transportation. So, I am very familiar with these discussions. Um, and so, the past uh, two sessions, I'm, we're wrapping up our, our biennium this December, and um, this entire biennium. Um, I have been, um, I feel like, a strong partner um, in um, the quest to um, save and promote and nurture our public transit because I do see exactly, I have read front to back all of the studies that have come out um, pre-pandemic and, um, and since then. And they all say exactly what I'm hearing from you guys. And so this is extremely helpful and I'm, super grateful that you all came out. I'm trying to arrange another uh, opportunity for GMT to, to come to Essex Town. I happen to be uh, a rep in a district that covers a little bit of the city of Essex Junction and a big part of Essex Town, the 23. Um, so I just, I, I don't think I introduced myself, but I'm Leonora Dodge. <laughs> so um, please just be aware that, that um, I'm gonna leave my my cards that have my legislative uh, email on the desk. So please feel free to take those. I will be paying a lot of attention to all of this. Know that this doesn't fall on deaf ears. We may not, like you can imagine, the state has so many financial pressures. The transportation budget also takes care of a lot of the flood you know, fixing fixing our roads and our bridges and, you know, all of our culverts that are there to protect us from getting flooded are 50 years old all at the same time because they were all built at the same time. So having to replace all of that uh, is extremely expensive. Um, trying to, to, to <coughs> prevent damages and deal with damages from our extreme weather is, is part of the whole picture as well. And I'm, I just want to make sure that you you, you see and hear that um, in thinking about all of our transportation budget. I am really keen to hear any ideas, any people out there who want to be a voice with their employer and want, want somebody to help amplify that voice, want to help coordinate, um, you know, being able to, to I don't know, whatever, however you want, would want to do it. You know, if you want to have a sit down, if your employer wants to speak with GMT and a rep, I'm, I'm available. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming. Thank GMT for making this opportunity. Clayton has been a champion um, for, he's, he's got the whole picture in his mind. He understands 
the driver's needs, right? As riders, we may not be thinking about that. He understands the rider's needs and he understands the climate goals. And I, that's what I appreciate about Clayton. So, um, and we both happen to have worked at Congress Home, but in very different capacities <laughs> in many years ago. So we also have that strong connection to understanding seniors' needs. So um, I just wanted to say that and thank you all so much. Thank you, Representative Dodge. Our funding gap would be a lot wider right now if it wasn't for uh, Representative Dodge's past work. So, so thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and uh, I, I wish that I could say that I felt like I had it all figured out in my head, um, but uh, maybe I fake it well. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's it, a big puzzle. It's a big puzzle, and one of the things that I love about it. And uh, and in my introduction, um, I was going to tell you that you know my background is in human services. Mm -hmm. And I came to GMT because I think public transit is just an extension of human services. Every, every human services job I've ever had, I've worked with folks who have uh, difficulties getting around. And, uh, and so transit is, is that solution. Hey, we got some more hands. Rob, you wanna? Sure, Raj Chal, I'm one of the city councilors here. Um, on that note and on Representative Dodge's comment, I would encourage the legislature to think of this outside of the transportation budget. This touches the opioid crisis and access to care at Chinon Clinic and other, count and other places. Now the new emergency mental health uh, facility going up in UHC. It touches the requirements that have just been put down on communities like Essex Junction for housing. Um, it touches employment, everything we've heard here before. I mean, it's. Can you speak they, about the housing, the impact, how that, how the, the Our city manager could do it more eloquently, Regina Mahoney, but. Are you talking about reducing parking? Reducing parking, right. um, removing Act 250 review. Our community is seeing the growth on the bus routes specifically. We have a study going on right now looking at what that's going to look like for the next long term, really, I mean, our future. Your community is doing the same thing. Um, the, the housing units are going in on the bus lines, essentially. Um, the state has required that we waive things. So this really needs to be looked at outside of the transportation budget, because if it's competing for transportation dollars when there's no actual funding mechanism for that budget, it's going to fail. And I think when Everyone's talking about employment and substance abuse and access to mental health care and health care and work. It just boggles the mind that the number 10 is on the schedule it is today, considering that area it covers is one of the most successful manufacturing areas we have in the county, Sand Hill. Um, so I just really encourage folks to reach out to the legislators and make the point that this, is, this really doesn't, shouldn't be counting on the transportation budget alone. I think that's a great point. I think there was another hand. Yep. I just wanted to point out um, when we're talking about uh, construction uh, on the roads, something that's almost hilariously unfortunate about construction is that it also stops traffic, which increases uh, idle transmission. So, working on the roads to repair them specifically. Um, not only hurts the budget that goes into the bus, but increases emissions. So I'm almost wondering if we should take a look at how to better protect the roads so they don't have to be prepared, or repaired as much. I can tell you that's a bit out of GMT's purview, but I support that idea because we hate potholes. Our tires, the cost that we have uh, uh, from bad roads, uh, if, if they were, uh, if they were smoother, our, our mechanics would be a lot less busy. Clayton, I'll, I'll bring that back around. I'm not going to answer that correct exactly, but um, I will say uh, I think part of the state's overall mission of, of trying to densify housing um, along the places that we have infrastructure already, water, sewer, um, and most importantly, transit service, is so that we don't continue to build more roads further out and out and out. 
um, and continue to have more infrastructure needs, the wider we spread ourselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just all that much better to get more users on the infrastructure that we've already have in place mm -hmm. so that we can better afford to um, do the maintenance of those systems in a tighter place. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, and, and hearing the comparison with infrastructure is, is this the second time today um, so I had uh, I met with Senator Chittenden today uh, because you know Senator Chittenden is on the Senate Transportation Committee. He's very concerned about this, and you know his comment was, you know, transit is infrastructure. You know, it should not be treated as an optional. It's it's, it's just like your trash pickup. It's just like your water. It's just like all of the other things that it should be. That's the way it should be looked at. And so I, I think the idea of having it look beyond just the transportation budget. Um, and, uh, and treating it like infrastructure would really make sense to me. Oh, hey, in the back. Do you want to come all the way up? Do you want to come all the way? Oh, you don't want to? Okay. You don't even have to take me. <laughs> um, I just if you could just say to your name so that when we do transcribe the, uh, oh, all the time. Amanda. Okay. Um, Are you okay telling us your last name? Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to um, be here on behalf of the teenagers in the area. I don't know if um, it's already been brought up, but um, as a single mom, I expect my kids to work. Um, they're teenagers and um, we have one car for myself and two kids. So the bus system is really important to families like mine. Um, Getting up to Essex Town, my daughter works in Essex Town, and my son is walkable here in town. But um, so I just wanted to come and say, as the city is growing, as the town is growing, the schools are also growing, the kids are also growing, and there are families that expect their kids to work as teenagers, and um, that can be really good for our community. And I think that it would be really harmful if they can't get on the bus system for families as well as kids so thank you uh, teenagers are important i was surprised to find my 14 year old uh, here at the library uh, when i came in <laughs> and, uh, because this is my home uh, too and so i'm glad that you spoke up uh, uh, for them and i'm i was glad she was at the library after school i was like oh my gosh <laughs> proud of her She's stopping you. No, maybe. He paid her to be here. <laughs> so, yeah. Smart. Uh, do we do we want to answer the the why do we have such big bus questions now? That'd be great. All right. So one of the first things I asked when I got here, why do we have big buses? Because you know, especially in the evenings, I look around and I see, oh man, it's you know the bus is moving around and it's, and it's uh, uh, not very full. When you look at the overall cost of of our buses and the cost of our service, um, it actually, there's not a huge cost savings uh, for operating a full-size bus as opposed to the smaller bus. One of the reasons why is that our full-size buses are probably more like boats than they are like uh, 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 cars. They, they last 12 years. And, um, uh, and so a, a diesel bus costs us about $600,000. We can get 12 years worth of life out of it. Um, and it can operate under any of our urban routes. If we were to get a smaller bus. Like a cutaway. Like a, 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 a say what, cutaway. They typically cost about half as much, but they only last about five years. And so our capital costs over time wouldn't be any less. Um, they do take a little less gas, but the biggest cost is the driver. And so it's going to be a CDL driver, uh, whether you're, whether they're driving a 40 foot bus or a 20 foot bus. And so we've made the business decision that it is best for us to have inter interoperability where any of our urban buses can run any of our urban routes, um, because that cost savings really is just the difference between the cost of fuel for a smaller bus, um, which may be, you know, like a, a, a few miles to the gallon um, uh, difference between the two. Don't forget how expensive it is to train mechanics on yes. a different bus. Yes. You have to train them on how to repair everything that's different 
exactly. on a different brand of bus or we, a different style or a different fuel source. We bus. have to train them all. We have to maintain parts for them all. So And so it's something where by having all of our buses as close to the same as possible, it just there's a lot of um, economies of scale. There isn't a lot of major differences. Isn't there, is there, there isn't a lot of major differences when you do, when you do it a 30 foot, 35 or 40 foot bus? No. I don't, th I don't think so. And if they're from the same manufacturer. Um, I do know that we're moving to a different manufacturer for our electric buses. New Flyer. We already on that. We've heard, yes. That's already been new for a while. Yeah. For a while now. But yeah. so I have a lack of these. They seem to be only exclusively going to 40 footers, which is not something that's in, they need for the Route 10, like so he said. Mm -hmm. It's like a more like a 30 foot, 30. For of all the 30 footers, footers, for those that don't may not realize, is that a lot of the older buses, older bus, the buses 2012 and earlier or older are they're all. It's a lot of them have a majority of them have been have, are been retired, yeah, retired. Believe me, I've been in the garage. I've seen that happen. Yeah, I see that happen. And and for as for the 30 footers, early down a one. And they are, and it sounds, and it sounds like they're not replacing them. And thirty-five footers, they haven't gotten any new ones of those since twenty twenty-two. Twenty-two. And if you see, and, and if there's, and if you see any of the buses that have a four-digit number, the that it's a, it's the the first, the, the middle two numbers are a clue to what the, to when the buses were first first came out. Yeah. The, first came out. So I think it's about time that you got you get more thirty five foot buses that repl that eventually replacing the old you got 2010, 20, 20, 2007, 2010 buses that have uh, the buses that are in the, the, in twenty twelve that are on their way out. So I'll tell you our chief, happened. chief union steward, his favorite bus is that thirty footer that's still still there. I, I know his name. I, you know his name, you saw him last night? And that's that's his bus and-, and No, he, went, no, I, he wasn't there last night, I did. It, it's Nate, Nate is our chief uh, steward. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and so he loves the 30 footer. I, I don't think Dale will. So I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a question about um, the chart that, that we have here. Um, you know, I, I see the the straight up costs, and mm -hmm. I haven't seen what the revenues compared to those costs. Because of course, yeah. you know, what might look like an expensive route mm -hmm. per ride may actually be not that expensive in terms of overall cost because mm -hmm. you're getting the revenues from the school district, you're getting revenues from public private entities, yes. um, and riders who are paying a full yeah. fare. So um, that was one question. And then the other question I had about the, the buses was my understanding is that we actually get a lot of federal grants. Like, like in terms of where can we look for savings? Yeah. We actually, our federal money that we get mm -hmm. for, for public transit in Vermont, mm -hmm. which pretty much only comes to GMT, to our, what we call our urban agency. Yes. Um, helps pay for the bus itself, yes. the equipment itself. It's the, yes. it's the labor, mm. the staffing that is actually the more expensive, mm. you know. Well, I, I will say that the actual, you know, buses themselves, especially if you're gonna uh, be talking about electrification, um, are, are, you know, an electric bus costs us $1.1 million. So the question would be, people may say, hey, I just saw that in the news that you bought six electric buses this year. The capital funds that we receive from the federal government can only be used for, for purchasing buses. And so that's why we can't use them on operating. Because let me tell you, uh, I mean, our mechanics would, of course, you know, we, we need to cycle through our, our, our buses and we can't have too many old buses. But if, if I could trade in a couple of electric buses and retain all this service, you know, I would do that in a heartbeat. Uh, but we just aren't allowed to do that. When it comes, um, but I, I will say that even though that's a sort of an annoying rule that the feds don't let us move that money, but I have to be thankful because the feds pay for 80% of the cost of all of our buses. They pay for 90% of the cost of our electric buses. You know, so, you know, un Uncle Sam is being good to us on the capital side. Uh, when it comes to the, the costs, you're absolutely right that there's a different, um, essentially almost formula for each route based on the assessments uh, that come in, 
based on whether it's funded through, uh, I'm going to throw some jargon out there, whether it's a CMAC route or whether it's a, it's a normal route. Um, and if it's a normal route, it's a 50% it's a federal share. If it's a CMAC route, it's 80% federal share. So one of the things that Chris and our finance folks are doing um, through this process is making sure that we do have that balance uh, between the this is how much revenue is coming in here uh, to make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in, in the foot uh, when we do that. We also know that those cost estimates on savings uh, we know are low, but we wanted to make sure that all surprises would go in the direction of having less um, customer uh, or less service reductions. Um, we know that those uh, savings are, are low because, um, like I mentioned, the Saturday night service um, being the most expensive because that's when we have people uh, who are uh, being forced overtime, which means they get uh, twice pay um, or regular overtime. Um, and so when we use those figures, we just used a flat transit rate that would treat every hour of service as if it was the same cost, but we, we know that it's not. As we continue to clarify this process, we'll continue to, to do things like that as well. Could I add one more thing? Please? Yes. Um, so the in the chart that was provided, the uh, cost per ride column, that came directly from the uh, VTrans route performance report that Curtis mentioned earlier. And so that was with FY23 when we weren't charging any fares. Um, and so in FY24's report, at least for GMT, since we are um, having fares in that year, those cost per rides would be reflective of the operating cost minus you know any revenue that we would be getting from fares on those particular routes. So that would essentially help bring down that cost when the state is looking at yes. um, at those routes. One other thing that I just wanted to mention from so earlier. Can I just follow yeah. up on that? So what, so, so you, are you saying that this chart is based on the 24? For 23. Yeah. Just we don't, so have, we don't that, have that. Correct. Yet. The state has not uh, done, VTrans has not done that report yet, and they will typically do that in the fall and release that at the beginning of the legislative session. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention too, uh, is, uh, and Regina can correct me if I'm wrong, is you know the, the city of Essex Junction is committed to, to transit and is looking at building a brand new uh, multimodal transit center um, at the Amtrak. I don't know if you wanted to talk more about that, but I think that's a, another sign oh, that you know, the city is committed. Yeah. Isn't, that something yeah. that's, isn't that something that's already progress? Yeah. Like at the construction, the Amtrak construction. Yeah, so we already have um, about three million dollars from a federal delegation spending for that project and so we just um, put out an RFQ to get a design team to get that up and running so that will uh, really improve uh, the look of our um, of our train station and um, really invite people in terms of that multimodal space um, I also will say on the new crescent connector that's Soft, o soft opened right now. Um, we have um, EV chargers and bike lockers. So another sort of, um, not the bus isn't gonna go there directly, but is a place where um, if you needed to store a bike long-term and can take another form of transit, um, that those are available over there as part of that project too. So uh, certainly trying to, in a variety of ways, try to build the infrastructure in the center of the city here to um, support ways of getting out of your vehicles. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name or okay, your role. Sorry, Regina Mahoney, the city manager here in Essex Junction. Thank you. What else do we want to talk about? Okay. What's the volatility of these buses? Like, how often are they ending up in the repair shops just for failing? I don't think that I can answer that uh, off the top of my head. Okay. What I, what I can tell you is that this will shock you as they get older, they require more maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we tend to see is that when the buses first come in, um, there's a sort of a break in period where a lot of things will end up happening, and once that sort of you get through that, um, then um, to, towards the tail end. I, I can tell you, we haven't talked about this at all. One of the things Representative Dodge will probably get to hear about this coming year is that um, we are having more volatility with our vehicles just because um, over a quarter of our fleet are over 12 years old, the big buses. And so they are taking a lot more uh, to, to keep on the road. 
But yet again, yeah, this is an experience where I'm not seeing any busts. 2017. Okay, oh, God, get, those are seven years old already. I can't believe that. I have not seen, very rarely have I ever seen any busts 2017 or newer break down. Break down like the, those buses seem to be growing so smoothly. Like I don't think I don't think those buses have ever had any problems. No, they've had 2012 20, and earlier. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> even, that, so even 10 years ago, the 2012s were were having a little bit of an issue. Yeah. It's just one time to time, but it's not mo nothing major then. But I will tell you that one of the very odd things, um, you know, I thought human services was complicated. And so coming to coming to transit, I thought, oh, pff, this is going to be so easy compared to humans. Oh, my God, this is so complicated. <laughs> so I mentioned before that the federal government is paying for us 90 percent to have those electric buses. But in order for us to get money for them, they have to replace an older diesel bus, which we have to keep on the road until the new electric bus comes in. So it's like a two, it's gonna take us, when we put in an order today to get a new electric bus, it'll take us two years before it arrives. Which means that we have these buses from 2009 time frame that we're still keeping on the road that we'll have to keep on the road till 2026 so that when the electric bus comes in, we can turn that in. Uh, we still have buses from 2007. Wow. Yeah. Seven, of not many, that's, but... That's why I said these are like ships. <laughs> you know, they, they, and, and we will, you know, we, um, we budget every year for a couple of engine overhauls where we'll, you know, bring in an, uh, an entirely new, you know, engine for one of these and they just keep on trucking. Um, nobody mentioned this, but one of the proposals was bringing in uh, women's prison um, into Essex, one down off the River Road um, was one of the proposals. The other was up, I think, up on the Cirque. Um, oh, ew. Um, so they're talking about a 300 inmate, which might, you know, with staffing and all the other people, social workers and lawyers and everybody else is involved within that system. Um, I would think that having a bus system, considering a lot of the inmates most likely aren't going to have a car if they're released. They're, um, so I think that's going to be an impact on where that um, inmate facility might be located if we don't have sufficient transportation covered. Uh, I would certainly, you know, um, for employees and uh, the folks coming out, you know, having access to public transit would be really helpful there. Parks of Dodge. Sorry, uh, somebody else. It's hard see, for me to see I, behind. I don't see anyone. I was a teacher for a long time, but I, I've lost. <laughs> I've lost the fact of the Ethed eyesight. Um, uh, we hear a lot about like what they call micro transit or yeah. on-demand mm -hmm. transit. Um, that's sort of like the SSTA, you know. Yes. Like, I guess for for um, to kind of get a concept of, of what what we're talking about, and um, you know, is is has that been uh, approached with either local employers or you know, um, and also I guess. Because I, I haven't seen any any um, like I've heard public public hearings, but I haven't heard specifically whether there's going to be like approaching the lake chamber, mm -hmm. you know, like the business entities in our that that would be really affected by this mm -hmm. and developers, um, you know, the folks at the Essex Experience. And yeah. so I just want to. Yeah. I, I can tell you we've taken advantage of the fact that our uh, immediate past chair is with the, was with the chamber and Austin has uh, has been uh, doing a good job of raising this um, with the uh, they have a regional um, meeting of uh, developers and, and large businesses that come in and this has been a topic uh, that has come up there uh, hopefully that will then result in maybe some uh, action on their part um, the uh, the thing that you were said before that I can't remember, but I remember I wanted to comment on it. Oh, microtan, yes. So um, one of the things that we are doing right now um, is studying whether it would make sense to add microtransit to that ADA service that I talked about. Because if we already have um, sort of this built-in geographic area um, that is providing essentially microtransit type service uh, for ADA customers, what would it be like to add that 
um, uh, to non-ADA customers. We're doing a study now uh, to take a look at that. I can tell you that it's a study that's happening now. We'll probably get the results um, you know, next year. And I think in, in light of everything that's happening, you know, I don't see us you know, moving you know, forward with it um, you know, promptly unless there was a positive surprise um, uh, financially. But I think that that is something that um, uh, we're looking at because our concern is is that we want to make sure that instead of having like an Essex microtransit and a South Burlington microtransit and a Colchester microtransit, that it would just be sort of a, a combined uh, unit. I think that that would work well. Anything else? Anything that you could ever want to ask the GM of GMT about, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Did you guys adopt any of the bus drivers from the schools? Um, we adopted a bunch of bus drivers from Yellow um, when they uh, went bankrupt in, in Williston. And, um, uh, and shortly after that is when we stopped hiring new. Um, we are hiring new in our rural areas, especially in Washington County. So if anybody wants to get a CDL for free and make $30 an hour driving a bus in Washington County, send them, uh, send them our way because we still are not able to operate full service in Washington County because of a, a driver shortage. That kind of prompts another question I have. Um, with that driver shortage, you know, that you're experiencing in Washington County, one of the proposals that you made in the service reduction plan was either eliminating the link runs or transferring them to Washington County. Yes. Um, I mean, how does that, how does that impact that? Well, the way it will impact that is, is that they're going to have to continue their current success in recruiting and not lose folks in order for them to even be able to do it. So, so there's that big if. Um, the um, really one of the um, one of the reasons why I want to push the conversation of having it go to rural is that right now the link service, the the local match, is only paid by Chittenden County municipalities, and so. Um, if this were a rural service, then we would need to be looking at, you know, Montpelier and St. Albans uh, and saying, hey, you all are benefiting from this, you know, as well, too. And I know that your coffers may not be as big, but um, uh, but that that's certainly one of the reasons for pushing for that. See, I was see, because I was on that interview last night because I was at that meeting last night and talked about the link, like possibly being moved to rural and. I'm like no, not all routes. No, all routes no, because I, because I take the Montpelier link. If it, like midday is on one trip, okay, okay, I'm used to that. That's fine. But but usually when I return to Burlington, I'm taking one of the last two buses, five twenty, which is currently at five twenty or six oh five, no, like six oh five to go back to come back to, to come back up north, no, Thank you, to north, which which Thank starts you. in Burlington and goes starts in Burlington, goes down and goes to. It's something that I've noticed. It's, it's I mean yes, I've definitely noticed the ridership on those two last two trips. To, it's just, it's this, as, as well as the southbound, the same, the southbound trips around the same time because now that Wilson Parkway has an option, I can, I can, I can just go back straight to Wilson. Now we have to go, have to go all the route without even have to go on the crowded number one bus. No, one of the bus. So say by you, it's one of those two. And I've already, I've already seen what's happened when, when Middlebury was transferred to GBT. In some ways, it got worse. No, Got worse. No, worse. You know that evening service from Middlebury, Burry to come back to Burl, come back to Burlington was gone. The last one was ended up being three twenty afternoon, and that is before lots of people were out of work. So that was a, that's out of luck. And that's been July twenty twenty one. If Montpelier would have switched to all be operate all all out of rural, yeah. it could be mess. That could be messy because. The, because then the buses would be out of Montpelier. I would would not would have to leave very early, very early and get very little time in Montpelier. It's not very fair. So, yeah. especially if I'm safe. I actually did. I actually did this once. Marcy T changed their schedule to operate all the trips out of St. J. US two 
US2, and that actually allowed me to go there and back in the same day. But by the, but that would mean, I mean, I have taken an earlier bus back to, to Montpelier just to catch that link. To, yeah, the link, and they all operate out of Montpelier, and they all, and that would not leave me a lot of time in the in the capital district if if they were to. So that's why I'm more. That's what I'm worried about. Is that they may uh, don't worry about they may it may force the Burlington to Montpelier buses all later and you know, all later and all earlier out of Montpelier, yeah. all too early out of Montpelier. And I've been on the four eighteen, the eighteen bu fourteen bus because that one goes to Wilson Parker. Those that is the big that is the one that, that goes to Montpelier that has the biggest ridership of all the BM runs. Mm -hmm. 458 the second highest you're, you're definitely you know right thomas that you know if, if if everything ends up being operated out of rural it's kind of operating with the assumption that the the traffic is moving primarily from st albans and montpelier towards burlington which means that the first runs are are headed in and that the people in Burlington who need to get to St. Albans or Montpelier may be adversely impacted. That the, um, similarly, <coughs> the last run of the day going in that direction would be, uh, um, or, or do I have it backwards? But I definitely know in the morning, um, it may mean that the people would be getting to Montpelier and St. Albans later. And, and Clayton, could I just add one other thing? Please do. I, I think, um, you know, we all know that transit really is a, a regional, uh, a regional resource for residents, for employers, for everybody. Um, I wish I could remember which study of the numerous studies that have been done in the past couple of years, but one of the general concepts when looking at different revenue sources to help fund GMT and all the transit providers, there's a concept uh, in one of the reports that is we all pay a little bit for transit. So even here in Essex Junction, if you were going to go get on the Wilson parking ride and go to Montpelier or go to Burlington, you know, yes, the, the stop isn't here in Essex Junction, but you may drive to the parking ride and go northbound or southbound, but um, transit is a regional model and then we all pay a little, it helps, you know, increase the cost a little bit for everyone, but for the, the greater public good. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start this by saying I don't know anything about the situation with SSTA. Would you be able to use SSTA uh, to take over some of the routes that don't have as many people? Very interesting that you asked that, and I wish that Adam hadn't just left that time because uh, we actually are studying whether it would make sense to have some of GMT's rural service operated by other providers, and uh, and so one of the things that we're looking at is potentially having SSTA um, do our on-demand work um, in Franklin County. So, urban our GMT's urban transit. It's really just focused on the on the fixed route and um, and GMT's rural transit. We do both fixed route and the on demand services. And so because Chittenden County is large enough to have SSTA doing the on demand, they do on demand and we do fixed route and other places we're it's small enough that we do both. And uh, and we struggle with that um, uh, because, you know, our, our sort of historical background um, has been in fixed route. And so, uh, so we are looking at having SSTA come in. Not so much for here, because they're not really interested in operating fixed routes. That's, you know, their expertise is going and picking people up at their home and getting them someplace. Um, uh, but I, I, if they told me that they had capacity, I certainly wouldn't turn them down. I can address a little bit about that, be the SSTA writer. Um, it sounds wonderful. You get, you know, pick you up your home and drop you off at where you want to go in that time frame. Well, it doesn't work like that. I've had to learn to plan to be someplace maybe a half an hour to an hour to get there because I'm not the only person that they're picking up. Um, uh, sometimes I'll hear calls while I'm on the bus saying that, you know, um, they, they have more customers than what they plan for what they have ridership for so they'll try to you know in uh while they're driving try to figure out how to pick up this person in burlington um because they don't have a ride so um i've also had cases where how they configure their rides doesn't always make sense to me like um when i get picked up on west street thinking i'm going to go to essex theater um, but then we end up going to Williston to pick up somebody in Williston to go to Hereford in Williston, come back onto my street, two houses from where I live, 
to pick up some money who's going to go to Hanford and Essex Center. And it boggles my mind how they how they do these routes, but for them, I mean, it's a lot of juggling in putting together puzzle pieces to get people where they are. So I, I, I can't see them trying to incorporate more people than what they have to deal with right now. Thank you for sharing your experience. I think there's something that I mentioned that I did not see in the upcoming list of the other that could be that could be potential. Potential. Have you have you reconsidered considered about the Essex Junction trips that go to global foundries? No, well, foundries and that impact is. Uh, this, I take the seven o'clock often and often there isn't barely anybody there. Well, once in a while, the, once in a while there, there'll be some like one or two people, one or two people, but no. That maybe sometimes, but most of the time, not that way. It doesn't. That doesn't happen. Have you reconsidered that? Considered global foundry service on the two or move it back to the ten or the ten like it once was? Or what are you considering about that so, deviation? So here I'm going to phone a friend and and Chris. I don't know the, what what uh, considerations have we had global foundries be with our recommendation. So as part of this particular uh, plan, not necessarily, you know, one of the things that we changed the Global Foundry from going on the 10, as you noted, to the number two, one of our hopes was by, by bringing it from a larger population center in Burlington, folks that live there potentially would go, uh, who work at Global Foundries would, would take that. Um, I don't know the number off the top of my head uh, of our last stop level data, um, so I can't speak to exactly how many number of people, um, but that certainly is, uh, a, could potentially be a consideration in the future. You know, one of the things as part of this was surveying riders, passengers, the riders, um, GMT staff, the GMT board, and municipalities. And um, we asked, you know, sort of transit, basic transit planning principles of what folks were willing to trade off um, in transit service. Um, and a lot of folks, you know, want a more direct ride, um, they noted. And so that, that could lead to um, looking at some of the individual spurs that we have that go to uh, major employers. I can tell you that we're going to continue to look on uh, for all of our routes um, where we have areas that you know may have less you know overall ridership um, to, to make sure that um, you know we can be as equitable as possible um, and if there are stretches of a route um, where the overall route may be performing wonderfully but there's a certain portion of it that's not um, you know, we need to look at that. So thank you for, for raising that and we'll make sure. That and that would certainly be part of uh, microtransit micro studies, you know, looking at those types of things where that might be a better model yeah. for that type of transportation. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, I, I started by saying um, how much I appreciated you being here and I want to end by that because um, like I said, everything that you say tonight, uh, we're recording it. Uh, it's recorded here. It's going to get transcribed. Um, it's going to go into the packages that the GMT Board of Commissioners will all get whenever they have to look and, and, and they start their discussions for making final decisions. It's going to go to every transportation committee member in the, uh, the House and the Senate. It's going to go to all of our municipal partners. Um, so, you know, people will see how these changes impact the real life folks that, that came out tonight and so thank you for for sharing that because as much as i may think that uh um you know i would love to be able to go in and you know express this is what our needs are you know i'm just a bureaucrat you know hearing from you you know you're the ones that are going to be living this and and one of the things that i love about vermont is that we're still human scale and uh, you can walk into the state house and advocate for issues um, without an appointment, without having to go through security. You can sit in on, on testimony, um, whether at the state house or at your local select board. And so because we're still at human scale, I've just seen many times decision makers, uh, when they hear how things are going to be impacting your life, that they, that they listen to that. Um, and so thank you for being here. Thank you for adding uh, to, our, um, to our defense of our service. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your nice day. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.